Black Lives Matter. Let me say it again, Black Lives Matter. The chocolate, sultriness of my pigment, all hues of brown, bitter as the night. Or a dark piece of chocolate, sweet as the morning, or a swig of caramel. Black Lives Matter. The roundness of my nostrils that help me breathe in and breathe out. As Kanye West and Ludacris rhymed, breathe in, breathe out. If you're iced up, pull your sleeves out. Black Lives Matter. The nappiness of my hair, well, when I had more hair. <laughs> the thick curls that made me tear up as my mom combed my hair on my way to school. Rest in peace and power, mom. Black Lives Matter. So if black lives matter, when did I learn to curse my blackness? Well, some time ago. It started before I even knew how it started. And when it started, it kept going before I even knew where it went. And when it went, it moved before I even knew how it moved. And when it moved, it became normal before I even knew that normal had a sibling called natural. And when it became natural, it became internalized before I even knew that I started to believe. And when it became a belief, well, you know the rest. Black lives matter? On that matter, hear the question in my cadence the uncertainty, the tone of my voice, the question mark, one of the most powerful forms of punctuation that punctuate hesitancy, anxiousness. But if the question mark can signal hesitancy, know that it can also conjure up confidence, boldness. For to question, especially for the first time, is to boldly name an alternate reality, a reality not chosen for me. A question mark can signal disbelief, challenge, assertion to not accept one's internalized oppressive path. So now I can say, do black lives matter? And you hear how the question at the end of that sentence is actually a declaration, a statement. Wilson Okello taught me the concept of rehearsal, of practicing, hearing how my voice sounds, declaring my new reality and seeing how it feels. So today, I rehearse publicly for you that black lives matter. And I assert that with confidence boldness and certainty that black lives matter. Good morning, everyone. I guess it's afternoon now. Um, so, you know, the weather is getting a little bit warmer outside and it's the end of the semester of madness. Um, so I'm really appreciative that you chose to spend a few minutes with us here today. I'm excited to join with you today and talk about a topic that I'm thinking more about these days. It's a new area for me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research progression, but this is I'm testing out some ideas today. So I'm really curious about your feedback um, as I wrap up my talk at the end here, um, as these are some new ideas that I'm wrestling with here today. Um, so I appreciate that introduction, Ebony. Thank you so much. So I am a scholar activist. I'm unabashedly a black scholar activist. For me, my scholarship, my scholar activism exists at the intersection of my subordinated black identity, my dominant cisgender man identity, and my roles as parent, faculty member, and scholar. At the intersection of these identities and roles, I engage in scholar activism. For most of my career, I have developed a reputation as a dialogue expert. My research agenda has focused on how people talk about difficult issues in productive ways. Now, when I say difficult issues, I mean things like race, privilege, power, and oppression. I have studied the strategies people use to facilitate these dialogues, as well as what students learn about themselves and others from engaging in these dialogues. This topic has fueled a passion for me for the first five years of my faculty career. And then August 9th, 2014 happened. On August 9th, 2014, Darren Wilson, a white police officer, shot and killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. This happened five days before I submitted my promotion and tenure materials. Tenure didn't seem to matter in that moment, nor did my fall classes. Michael Brown's death, 
affected me and made, fe made me feel fear in my black body in a way I hadn't felt fear previously. Even though I was feeling numb following Brown's death, on my predominantly white Miami University campus, where 87% of the students identify as white, things seemed to be moving on as business as usual. How was it possible that Michael Brown's death impacted me so gravely, and yet it seemed like so many people around me were moving through life unaffected? I felt angry at them for their obliviousness. And I felt envious of their ability to just move through life giggling and carrying on seemingly without a care in the world while I was shaken and fearful of being the next black person killed by a police officer. Now prior to Michael Brown's death, I didn't identify as an activist. I was a scholar only. In many ways, I felt forced into activism. Because I was feeling so numb, and unable to move through the, into the fall semester, I met with two of my colleagues, Mahogany Shaw and Dominique Hill, at a local coffee shop to process and make sense of Brown's killing. Now, Mahogany is, a, is from a town near Ferguson, and she too was struggling with moving into the fall semester amid so much pain. Our processing of Michael Brown's death resisted the business as usual attitude that seemed to pervade so much of Miami University. Out of our conversations at the coffee shop that day, we decided that we were not just going to move on as if nothing happened. We needed to be angry, grieve, and mourn Brown's death. We started connecting regularly and checking in on each other. During one of our chats, we decided that we wanted to create a space for others to also grieve, be angry, and mourn Brown's death. We planned a working town hall meeting um, to, to process Brown's death. Now, coincidentally, our working town hall meeting occurred shortly after the grand jury decision in the Michael Brown case. We called it a working town hall meeting because we wanted people to do some work during the session and engage in some sort of action moving forward. Ultimately, we formed what we called the Mobilizing Anger Collective a group of faculty, students, staff, and Oxford, Ohio community members who regularly connect to address injustices on our campus and the surrounding Oxford community. The MAC, the shorthand version of our group, has held a silent protest, an open mic night, community meetings, and other events to mobilize our anger into action and healing. The Mobilizing Anger Collective provided community for me and a place to blend my forced activism with my scholarship. As we planned and executed more events, I felt more comfortable claiming my activist identity. Although I didn't want to necessarily become an activist, I embraced this role and saw the blend of my activism and scholarship as a way to make meaning of something so senseless. The purpose of my talk today is to il illustrate what scholar activism is and why I felt the need to blend my scholarship with my activism. I connect my scholar activism specifically with Black Lives Matter as my activism specifically with Black Lives Matter has spurred my scholarship. Following that, I discuss shame and guilt and fictive kinship and how these three concepts relate to scholar activism. And finally, I talk about self-care and healing and the importance of working to heal in the face of racism directed toward black bodies. Let's start with scholar activism. I should have said at the beginning, um, I have a Twitter handle down there. So if you're wanting to share some feedback throughout my talk, I'd be glad to look at it once I finish. Um, so you can follow me at SJQ and then use the hashtag scholar activism. So prior to Darren Wilson killing Michael Brown, I didn't consider myself an activist, as I said earlier. As a faculty member, I taught classes on privilege, power, and oppression, and researched how to engage in dialogues about these topics. The primary population with whom I worked was graduate students, teaching them in my courses, advising them, chairing their dissertations, and working with them on research projects. And then, as I said, August 9th, 2014 happened. And all that research, writing, teaching, and scholarship seemed so insufficient. 
and I felt empty and I felt afraid and I felt angry. Researchers have found that people with minoritized bodies often don't consider what they do to be activism. They label it as merely surviving in their minoritized identities. Many of the actions that campus administrators praise and reward, such as service learning, are sanctioned by the institution and lead to student engagement outcomes, while actions that are deemed more bold or disruptive are not as rewarded. For example, um, in a study about student activism and intersectionality, Chris Linder noted that when students advocate for systemic change on their campuses, campus administrators often resist their advocacy and have developed strategies for ignoring or waiting out the student activists, end quote. In a different study on what student activists say they need from campus administrators to feel supported, Chris Linder and I found that student activists who perform actions not lauded by administrators faced more resistance from administrators. It's not surprising then that these bolder, seemingly more disruptive actions are more often done by students with minoritized identities. When Dominique Mahogany and I decided to start the MAC, we did so out of desperation because we saw no other way to make sense of our pain, anger, and fear. We needed to do something to survive in our black bodies. We decided to call ourselves the Mobilizing Anger Collective in order to trouble anger as a negative emotion. Too often, when black people express anger, we are told we need to calm down, are being too sensitive, or are overreacting. Stereotypes abound about the angry black person. We wanted to see anger as an expected and necessary emotion when racism is so rampant. And we also wanted to turn or mobilize our anger into action. My work in the MAC transformed my scholarship. Again, I didn't expect to be interested in scholar activism, and yet I am because I needed to be an activist to survive in my black body and move through my pain and grief. As a result of my activism, I now blend that activism with my scholarship. For example, Mahogany, Dominic, and I recently published an article on the MAC in the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. In it, we write, for us, however, we saw our scholar and activist identities constantly blurred and blended. Although we have sometimes wrestled with the tensions between these two identities, more often than not, both roles exist in a connected manner. For instance, during the silent protest, we recalled Rustin's words of needing to tuck our bodies in places to promote change. Even the mere act of walking across campus in our black bodies served as a reminder of our activism. At times, we have needed to articulate the goals for our activism to get funding for various events, thereby drawing on our scholarship about the purpose and outcomes of activism." End quote. Shame, guilt, and fictive kinship are now three concepts I want to discuss to illustrate how they connect to scholar activism. So let me start with an example to help illustrate the difference between these concepts. Now, let's say I'm supposed to meet my friend for lunch and it's 12 o'clock and my friend calls me and says, hey, Stephen, where are you? Um, we're supposed to meet at 12, it's now 12.20 and you haven't showed up, like, what's going on? Um, now, one thing, one reaction I might have to my friend might be something along these lines. Oh my gosh, I'm really, really sorry. I was working away on this article and I totally lost track of time. How can I make it up to you? Do you have time next week? Let's reschedule. So that's one potential reaction I might have to my friend. Another reaction might be something along the, these lines. <sighs> I told you I was really, really busy and you kept asking me to have lunch on this day and now I've missed lunch and I'm really frustrated. Whenever I tell you I'm busy, you never listen to me and now I'm just annoyed about having missed this lunch. So hopefully you see the two differences in those reactions. So somebody, rather than me telling you, somebody tell me what you see as the two differences. What do you notice about those two reactions that I had to my friend? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Thank you. Anything else that people heard in the two reactions? So Ebony said my tone. That's how you're going to. Yes. Yes. If I had some money, I would give that to you right now because that was the, exactly the, the answer. So, um, so all three, so Ebony's point about the tone and then um, the other two around accountability to me is, is, a, is a big difference going on here. So um, in the first reaction, my, my reaction is, is, um, is that way because I'm feeling guilt in the first reaction. So guilt is about focusing on your behavior or something that you have done that you deem to be problematic. And your, your desire then is to fix it, is to move through that guilt and resolve that guilt. When you're feeling shame, on the other hand, you think that you are a bad person. Um, and it's a more global assessment of your entire being as wrong or problematic. Shame is much harder to move through because it's a much more internalized feeling. Um, so a couple of things um, on this too that I just popped my head that are not scripted. So, um, so the first thing is that um, there was a time, so I mentioned that, I, that a lot of the classes I teach are around privilege, power, and oppression. Um, so I work on a predominantly white campus on any given class, let's say, and although my graduate program is much more racially diverse, um, but I taught at UNV 101, a first year experience class for undergraduate students last fall semester. Of the 24 students in my class, there are two people of color in that class. Um, and so inevitably, when you're talking about diversity inclusion issues, a common thing that comes up in these dialogues is white guilt, um, where white folks feel they're being blamed for racism. Um, a reaction might be, well, I wasn't around when slavery happened. Why are you holding me accountable for these things that my ancestors did? And I'm really frustrated about um, how, I'm making, how you're making me feel in my whiteness right now. Um, so I, I used to think of white guilt as a negative emotion. Guilt is actually a positive emotion, and I want white students to feel guilt in their whiteness because what that means is that they want to do something to resolve that guilt. Um, with guilt, there's, there are action steps one can take to resolve that. You want to change that, and you want to do better. If you're feeling white shame, however, that's a much harder place to come from because you're feeling like you're a bad person that's rooted in your whiteness. Um, and so the, it's, it's harder to come out of that place. And so for me, when I learned the difference between shame and guilt, it transformed my teaching in part because um, now I could see how I could distinguish when guilt was happening and when shame was happening. Now, the hard thing is that um, guilt can often manifest as guilt and then quickly morph into shame um, if one is not attending to that guilt immediately. Um, I'll talk a bit about sort of how one can attend to, sh to shame in a minute. But for me, those two distinctions are really, really critical. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, so when I was like probably seven or eight years old, my brother is two years older than me, um, we were throwing a baseball in the house um, for the umpteenth time that my parents told us we should not throw a baseball in the house. Um, but we're kids and so we don't listen. Um, and so we, I threw the baseball to my brother, he didn't catch it. See, I'm already placing blame on my brother. Um, but I threw the baseball to Les, he didn't catch it, and inevitably the ball hit a lamp, knocked it off the table, and broke the lamp. Um, I heard my mom scream my name, and I immediately darted to my room and hid in my closet. Um, I didn't know at the time when I was seven years old what I was feeling, but what I was feeling in that moment was shame. Because again, when you're feeling shame, one of the reactions of shame is that your body literally feels smaller, like you don't want to be seen. And so when you're feeling shame, you, often when people are feeling shame, like they'll, they'll, they will hide their face, they'll, they'll sort of like not want to be seen, and that's because you're feeling like you're a bad person. If I was feeling guilt in that moment, you know, I might have like st stayed there and said to my mom, mommy, I'm really, really sorry. I know you said I shouldn't even be throwing a baseball. What can I do to make it up? I don't know what I said as, as a seven year old, but that might have been something that I would have said in that moment because I wanted to resolve that guilt. So again, to me, guilt and shame are really two dis powerful concepts. They can look the same as you engage in, in work around um, diversity and inclusion, but they're actually very different concepts. Again, guilt is a positive emotion because you want to focus on your behavior and do something to change it. Whereas with shame, because you're focusing on your entire being as bad or problematic or wrong, it's a much harder place to come out of when you're experiencing shame. Um, all right, so let me get back to how this all connects to um, scholar activism. Okay. Um, 
So now all of us have likely experienced these two emotions of guilt and shame, likely many times in our lives. However, for some of us, our feelings of shame are rooted in our identities. Uh, Melissa Harris Perry, professor at Wake Forest University and author of the book, Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes in Black Women in America, wrote about the shame that black women feel um, and experience given the unique intersection of their race and gender. She writes about how as a people, black women have continually experienced shame in their identity as black women, and that shame is called collective shame. The reason it is collective is because of a concept called fictive kinship. Fictive kinship describes a feeling of connection, family ties, or kinship to people who we are unrelated to. And with fictive kinship, members of a particular group can feel pride in the accomplishments of members of their group. This is why so many black people, almost all of whom are unrelated to then Senator Obama, experienced such collective joy when he was elected president in 2008. We had felt that one of our own kin had finally made it in white America. Now on the flip side, members of the same group can feel collective shame when a member of that group does something wrong or fails. It's why I feel shame when I see a black man in handcuffs. Now, the reason I felt so much shame, or so much affinity rather, toward Michael Brown, and why I felt so much fear, was because of fictive kinship. I felt a strong tie to him, like his life could have been my own. And it's this concept of fictive kinship that spurred my activism as an educator. No matter my degrees, publications, awards, for many white folks, I am just another black person whose life is not valued in this society due to anti-blackness. Given the per pervasiveness of anti-blackness rhetoric in United States society, it's not surprising that many black people develop shame in their blackness. In Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me, he writes about living in his black body. Coates writes about the day Darren Wilson was exonerated of any charges for killing Michael Brown and the sheer pain he saw in his son's face when his son realized Wilson would not be charged. He writes, I did not tell you it would be okay because I never believed it would be okay. What I told you is what your grandparents tried to tell me, that this is your country, that this is your world, that this is your body, and you must find some way to live within the all of it." End quote. Relatedly, in one of my blog posts, Learning to Love My Blackness, I wrote the following. From an early age, I was taught to cover up, to hide my black body, to shield it in uniforms, intelligence, language, control, and obedience. For to open my black body to white eyes was to risk bruising. For me, this was not physical bruising that occurred on the streets. It was bruising of my ego, my heart, and my mind. The bruising that happens when I realize I inhabit a world not designed for me. A world in which I am merely a visitor, an immigrant, an alien, beast-like, inhuman, extraterrestrial. I'm just passing through eventually towards death, and as each day when I make it, I lose a bit more of my black body. The schools are designed for this strict, albeit hidden purpose, to slowly eradicate the black body, to punish it, control it, force it to succumb, submit under pressure. Discipline was the force that erased the black body. Memorization, rote learning, facts devoid of meaning. Each day I learned the white world while lessons about my black body from black body authors were non-existent. So I dressed up. On the streets, you wear your hoodies, do-rags, Nike Air Jordans, Levi's, Timberlands, earrings, and massive chains. In the white schools, you wear your khaki pants, clean-shaven face, loafers, and Ralph Lauren polos tucked in just like everyone else. As an adult, I transformed and increased this costume to blazers, kangle hats, bow ties, and colorful, playful pattern socks. Now, Harris Perry, Coates, and I, along with many, many other black people, have desperately tried to figure out how to live freely in our black bodies. For me, living freely within this black body means unlearning internalized oppression, the root of which I believe is shame. 
When we internalize our own oppression, we adopt and believe the messages that white America has fed about us, that we are merely thugs, gangsters, inept, and capable of succeeding and creating a life. All of these ideas breed shame. And living in shame means one is unable to live freely and boldly in their body, in this case, specifically, their black body. Black Lives Matter was a rallying cry to proclaim that black lives matter in a white world that is desperately trying to kill the black spirit, ego, and body. Black Lives Matter is an attempt to unlearn internalized oppression through fictive kinship. Now let me explain a little bit further. Just as fictive kinship can sometimes enable us to feel shame when members of our group fail or are portrayed negatively, this same concept can also foster collective pride. When I see black activists chanting and tweeting Black Lives Matter, I feel a sense of pride and collective love for these activists, most of whom I don't know personally. Black Lives Matter motivates me toward living freely and boldly in my black body. All of what I've said thus far brings me now to my final point for today, healing and self-care. To start off this section, I wanna share a poem I wrote called Both And. How can you experience joy if you are so angry? This is the question several of my white friends pose. My anger, it shines as bright as my cleanly shaven bald head. I'm worried about you, Stephen. Are you, or are you worried about your discomfort? I've seen a shift in you. Have you, or is how my black body used to make you comfortable now making you see my body as a source of disdain? Why are you so angry? Why aren't you angry? For to live in fear is to be angry, never settled, always uneasy and on alert. I occupy a both and space. The slash allows me to step in and out, to put on my bow tie during the day and my hoodie at night, to smile at you but cry inside. The slash means I can see the joy in my son as I fear for his first realization of racism. Laugh with friends but be tormented that they just don't get it. To be both and means to resist either or, or to sometimes occupy the either and the or, or to blend multiple eithers and ors. A little over a year ago, I started seeing a counselor. Turns out I engaged in a lot of negative self-talk. And until I started seeing a counselor, I didn't realize how much of it was rooted in the racism I experienced and the shame about my black body. Unlearning internalized oppression is hard stuff. And it's a process that is never ending. I had become so consumed by Michael Brown's death that I didn't think I mattered enough to take care of myself. Those of us who engage in activism need to practice self-care. It is so easy to get burned out, and for me, this looks like being impatient with my students and not experiencing joy in my parenting because I'm so afraid of being killed by a police officer and leaving Sebastian, my six-year-old. My healing process began with acknowledging that I matter that my black life matters. For me, healing looks like writing and journaling. Because I ruminate a lot and overthink so many things in my life, writing helps me process. I also say I am enough as many times throughout the day to myself as I need to. I also imagine the worst case scenario when I'm afraid and doing this normalizes my fear and it turns out the worst case scenario rarely happens. I also started running nearly two years ago, and this process enables me to process my feelings and emotions. And I unabashedly write Black Lives Matter and everyday blackness as a reminder that I can move through the world freely in my black skin, even if it rarely feels possible. Finally, I try and talk to black people who also have been told they are not black enough because it reminds me that my particular kind of blackness is in fact black enough. These are the healing strategies I have used over the past year. This summer, I'm embarking on a new research area, healing and self-care. It's a pretty awesome fly, right? 
Um, and the first of these studies will be interviewing black student affairs educators across the country to understand what strategies they use to heal from racial battle fatigue. Racial battle fatigue describes the exhaustion and mental and emotional pain black people feel from continued exposure to racism. Racial battle fatigue has deleterious consequences on our health and mental and emotional well-being. And it takes time away from being able to engage in more creative and life-giving activities. I want to know how black student affairs educators work to heal from racial battle fatigue so that others, myself included, can learn from their approaches. In closing, I have shared with you today my journey as a scholar, from understanding the process of difficult dialogues to embracing my scholar activist identity, to learning strategies for healing and self-care in the midst of racial battle fatigue. Ultimately, my journey as a scholar is deeply tied to my identities, in particular the salience of my blackness in a world that tries each day to deny my existence. Black Lives Matter, for me, is an act of resistance as I try to live boldly in all of my identities. I want to leave you with three takeaways. First, know that not every scholar will embrace and use the label of activist. For some scholars, merely existing and showing up in their bodies is an act of activism. Some might prefer the term resistance or even see their survival as a form of activism. Whatever term one uses, we must recognize and celebrate the varied ways scholars try to blend their activism with their scholarship. For some scholars, their activism is extra unpaid labor, and often promotion and tenure processes don't reward and recognize this activism. Next, the antidote to shame is to name it. However, Naming shame is hard because when we are feeling shame, we don't want to talk about it, particularly when we are feeling shame that is rooted in our identities. We must name our shame with people who have earned the right to hear our shame, those who will validate that what we are experiencing is real. Now, not everyone has earned the right for us to name our shame with. We must name it with a trusted person who will meet us with empathy. Otherwise, the shame spiral will continue. Finally, you matter enough to heal and practice self-care. It's important that you develop healing and self-care strategies that work for you. I have shared some of my own in this talk today, but these may not work for you and my list by no means is exhaustive. We cannot effectively do our work as educators if we are not taking care of ourselves. And I know the self-care mantra is overdone at times, and I know why black folks in particular are resistant to healing and self-care. And yet, living freely in our black bodies necess necessitates that we heal from our own internalized oppression and shame. So I appreciate you giving me the space to share some new ideas I'm processing, and I look forward to any questions and discussion that people have at this moment. Thank you all. <laughs>